All right, so here we are in lesson three already, and we're flying. Boy, time flies when you're having fun. Welcome back to the 30-hour post-licensing course. Uh, this lesson, we're going to cover contracts, and particularly in this first section, we're going to deal with the elements that are involved in a contract, all right? A contract is a legally binding agreement between parties to promise or not promise to do something for consideration uh, between the parties. So let's go over some of these elements. So the first thing a contract is going to need is the offer. And the offer is made by the offeror on the party. We probably would call this guy a buyer, all right? That's the guy making the offer. This offer he is going to tender over to the offeree, which we probably most often would call a seller. And here's his offer. Now, the offer, there are three things that can happen to the offer. It can be accepted. It can be rejected outright. You legally can just reject the offer. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going on recently and I get a lot of complaints from my agents about this about sending an offer over and you never hear from the seller side again they completely fail to even respond with a rejection unfortunately that is not a violation of any kind of ethical rule that says that they have to respond Matter of fact, if your client dictates to you, don't respond, then in theory, you can't respond. Now, I always try and tell my client, look, dude, let's at least sign a rejection, send it over. Let me tell them we're not sending it over. I mean, I have seen deals where sellers got such a low ball offer, they got ticked off at the buyer and just literally said, let the offer die. I don't want to even deal with it. So... Um, I've always wanted to write this class called Legal, Ethical, and Nice because those three things may not fall in the same realm. There are things that are purely not unethical like this, but it sure isn't nice when you don't hear something back from the other side, okay? Not unethical, just not nice, okay? So they could reject it, and then they could counter offer, all right? So a counter offer is another offer that would allow this seller to counter back to that particular buyer. Eventually what you want to get to is this acceptance here in the middle. And I have seen plenty of deals where You've offered, counter-offered, 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 and you couldn't come to a deal. So it's highly possible that even after counter-offers, you get a rejection because you just can't seem to bridge that final gap. Now, I am not saying that this is recommended, but I have done this, and I have had other agents do this. I have been, I was involved in a huge commercial deal where they were about $15,000 apart on like a million dollar property. I called the other agent and said, hey, look, dude, if we decide to take a little less commission, can we bridge this 15 grand so this deal gets done, all right? So in essence, what I'm suggesting is we spent $7,500 each to get to $22,000 commission. Yes, should I have made 30 grand? Probably. Could I have held out and maybe got it? Maybe. But this way, I definitely got to $22,500 and it cost me $7,500. I'm not advocating that you do this all the time. I'm just advocating that's potentially a possible rather than letting the buyer die out and the deal go away. You know, there might be a way to solve that problem. So what you want to get to is this here, an acceptance. So if you think you know what the word acceptance mean, try and define it for me. Now, one of my favorite quotes 
is by a uh, Supreme Court justice named Potter Stewart, and you can look this up. There was a Supreme Court case that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court that dealt with pornography. And the question was, was it pornographic? Or this film, was it pornographic? Or was it art? And the, obviously this little bitty city didn't want to show the property because they deemed it pornographic. And the director said it was an expression of art and it was protected under the free speech. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, the Chief Justice, well not Chief Justice, but one of the justices, Stewart, was the deciding vote and he wrote the treatise on this that explained their theory. And there is a very famous quote inside of that where he states that I cannot define pornography, but I know it when I see it. And this film is not it. All right. So I'm telling you now, do you think you can define acceptance? Can you know it when you see it? What does the actual acceptance of an offer mean? Here's what it means. For the offer to truly be accepted, both parties must know, all right? It is not just enough for your side of the table to go, yeah, we're gonna take this. It is not just enough for you to call the other agent verbally and go, hey, we're gonna take that. You actually have to, in writing, accept the offer and communicate it back to the other agent and up until they receive that acceptance, that offer is actually rescindable, okay? I literally have had this happen. My client and I were go had verbally agreed with each other that we were going to accept the deal, but before we could actually get Manny's signature on it and get it back over to the other side, we received a rescindance or a rescension of the offer, and I now had to explain to Manny, my client, why he agreed with me and I agreed with him three hours ago, it really wasn't accepted because we never communicated it back to the other side. So that is with the very essence of what acceptance mean. We also work under this thing called the mailbox rule, all right? You may have heard it called the posting rule. The mailbox rule states the second it hits your inbox, it is considered received. Technically, the second I hit send, it's received by you, all right? You are the representative for your client. Even if your client doesn't see it for two or three hours after that because of whatever reason, even if you don't see it for two or three hours after that, it's irrelevant. The fact is it's sitting in your inbox that is considered notification and you have, we have now officially accepted that deal. That is the definition. Both parties must know and understand. So your contract has to have an offer and an acceptance. Now, the parties have to have what's called the cap capacity to contract, meaning they have to be of legal age, and they got to have sufficient mental capacity to understand that. Basically not an IU grad. <laughs> That's coming from a Texas A&M graduate in Purdue, remember? So, no, really. Got to be of legal age. In the state of Indiana, that means 18. Unless they have been emancipated by court, that would count. And they got to have sufficient mental capacity. Now, there's a couple things in here that you might want to think about. We literally had a deal back in February of this year where the seller came to the closing drunk as a skunk, already celebrating the sale of his property. The title company at that time elected to not close the property due to his compromised mental capacity. All right. So there are situations where being drunk, being on drugs, those could compromise somebody's mental capacity and you may need to look for that if you are signing a listing agreement and the husband or the wife is drunk or stoned and they really can't hardly talk, uh, you may wanna realize that entering into that listing agreement may not hold up if they wake up tomorrow and go, what did I do? I did what? 
I want to get that undone. All right. So understand that. Now, there is this thing called adjudicated insane. If a court has determined they're insane, then they can never enter into a binding contract. However, there are other people that acted crazy, like my ex-wife. No, sorry, that was out loud. Didn't mean that. Um, what I meant was somebody that could potentially be bipolar. Uh, they could have ups and downs, and they could be construed as being crazy and may try or potentially be successful in disavowing a contract. So keep an eye out for those kind of uh, issues when dealing with your client. Another thing that could happen is, uh, or another item, is the consideration, all right? Consideration is anything of value between the two parties. Now, the key concept here is that we in the real estate world use what's called an arm's length transaction. An arm's length transaction means we do not know the other party, all right? Not intimately. If you think about the marriage contract, love, honor, and cherish is the consideration. That is the thing of value that you are receiving from the other person. That honor, that cherish, that love that you are receiving has value to you. In the real estate world, I don't know you, so therefore that love, honor, and cherish has no value. I want something else. And in real estate, that is money, okay? And you cannot charge love for money because that's a whole separate crime entirely, all right? So we have such a need for this monetary value that in our deeds, we actually have that generic statement called for $10 and other good and valuable services, all right? That means so that even if you actually give your property away, it technically has a nominal value of $10 so that it fulfills this requirement of consideration and makes that contract legal. Next element is the mutual of obligation, meaning both parties agree on their own free will to enter into this contract. It is called mutual ascension. Both parties have to do it on their own free will. They cannot be coerced. They cannot be intimidated. They cannot be the victim of a fraud, i.e. one person's lying. And they cannot be a victim of misrepresentation. This is another item that I have seen where an elderly parent was selling their house because the kid wanted to put them in a nursing home and during the listing uh, presentation, the son just kept telling his mother, mom, just sign it. Oh, come on, just get to it. Mom, just signed it. She could actually claim coercion. Doesn't necessarily mean it's from the other side. It could be from someone within their own camp that coerced them into this contract. It has to be mutually ascension. Both parties must agree on their own free will. You cannot take someone in the back room and break their knees to get them to sign the listing agreement. Um, I used to say you can't do this anymore. Technically, you never could do it, all right? It doesn't happen anymore, all right? So in real estate, remember this word that nobody remembers, that term, that we work under what's called the statute of frauds. The statute of fraud states that some contracts are of sufficient importance that to be defendable in a court of law, they must be in writing. Real estate works under the statute of frauds. We do not have an oral purchase agreement. We do not have oral listing agreements. We do not have oral deeds. Everything must be in writing including your counteroffers that you send over to let them know. So go back to my very first story when someone has asked me, what if you'd have called the other agent and told them that you were sending the offer or the assigned offer? Would that have counted? 
Absolutely not, because we work under the statute of frauds, which says, must be in writing. Now, if I'd have called that person and told them, and they still rescinded, eh, that could have been a dick move, but still not legally in violation. Once again, not unethical, not illegal, maybe not nice, all right? So I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break right here uh, in the middle of lesson three, dealing with contracts, and we'll come back and I'll see you here in just a few minutes.